welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Continetti, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and I'll be your moderator for today's Faculty and Research Town Hall. Once again, we have brought together a group of panelists to provide updates on the continuing evolution of our operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer your questions. As we are all aware, the pandemic has provided a range of unexpected challenges for us. In the face of these challenges, these town halls have played an essential role in keeping us united as a community. Some questions were submitted during registration. However, please feel free to use the Q&A window to submit additional questions for our panelists during today's webinar. Due to our time limitation, of course, we may not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log the questions as they come in and post answers in the Return to Learn website with the link pasted into the chat. Today's webinar has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that is pasted into the chat. And now I would like to introduce a, a, a video of welcome remarks from our chancellor, Pradeep Kozla. Chancellor Kozla. Good afternoon. And thank you for all of your hard work in keeping this campus operational. We have been successful to this point because of your commitment. We are evolving a return to learn strategy in response to the new and changing realities of COVID-19. We are balancing our collective desire for personal choice with our collective responsibility for greater public health. We are committed to providing you with the information you need to make decisions about your own health. Data show that COVID-19 case numbers are rising again on our campus and in the community. Newer variants are more easily transmitted. So consider your own risk and the risk to others while you're on and off campus. Masking with a KN95 or N95 is still one of the most effective ways to reduce the spread of the virus. When in doubt, wear a mask. Stay up to date on your COVID-19 vaccinations and boosters. Your continued awareness and commitment to good public health will help us navigate this new phase of the virus. I'm so proud of each and every one of you and what you do. And I'm so proud that you have allowed us to carry on our tradition of caring and respect. Keep up the great work and thank you one and thank you all. Okay, now I would like to uh, introduce welcome remarks via video from our co-host for today's town hall, our Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Elizabeth Simmons. Welcome and good afternoon. I'm sorry that I can't be here in person with you today. So I wanted to take the time to say welcome and to thank you all for being here to share, learn and discuss the latest campus updates. In wrapping up our academic year, it's been splendid to experience the spirit of celebration during our in-person commencement ceremonies and to have the chance to honor the work of our graduates from 2020 as well as those from 2022. Today at this town hall, we'll look ahead into the coming months to see what we can expect in the summer and beyond. The program that we have been calling Return to Learn will be evolving into a new form appropriate to our new operating equilibrium as a university. So I invite you all to stay involved, to continue sharing information across units and to further the collaborative spirit that our dedicated community has employed to get UC San Diego through the last two years together. We've discovered that town halls like this one are incredibly valuable for sharing critical information and also for building a broader sense of cohesion and collective purpose. So we'll continue to provide a similar forum in the future. Please watch for announcements in the fall. Congratulations to all of you on making this a far more successful and vibrant academic year than anybody could ever have dreamed was going to be possible. You've worked tremendously hard to achieve that. And now I hope that you will all take some well-earned vacation and just come back ready and refreshed again in the fall. Thank you so much. Now I would like to welcome remarks from our second co-host for today, Vice Chancellor for Research, Corinne Peak Asa. Hello everyone. And I'm actually very happy to be here as a live virtual person, um, whereas Pradeep and Elizabeth both had to be recorded virtual people. Um, and I, I, I just wanna 
echo a thank you. I'll say that again uh, later in remarks. Um, probably as with all of us, uh, a big happy summer uh, and welcome to summer. I do encourage you as Elizabeth did uh, to take some vacation and make that real vacation. It's so important for our brains to get some time away and to regroup. Um, but I also am very cognizant that most of our jobs are maybe a little different over summer, but continue uh, and are um, kind of equally busy <laughs> with a lot to get done over the summers. So I also hope that as we have a little bit more flexibility in where we work and how we work, that we can all really take pleasure in our ability to spend some time in person. Um, and hopefully as we're getting back to some of the meetings and some of the groupings, uh, that we can take a little time at the beginning of each of those to, to check in with each other and, and to um, really enjoy not being virtual people, but real people in each other's company. So with that, I will turn it back to Bob so we can get started on our program. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Piquesa. I would now like to introduce our first group of presenters who will give us an update on the pandemic and campus health and safety. Professor of Medicine, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, Dr. N Natasha Martin, and Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing, Dr. Angela Sosha. Dr. Schooley. Thanks very much, uh, Vice Chancellor Connetti, and uh, welcome to everyone this afternoon. Uh, we're going to try to give you uh, in our um, three-part presentation a little sense of where things are going nationally, where things are going more locally, particularly on the campus, and some of the approaches that we're recommending on the campus in terms of uh, COVID mitigation. Uh, as we shift from this period of uh, more and more uh, top-down to bottom-up decision-making in terms of how we um, approach our health. Uh, as you heard from Chancellor Kostla and from the news, we uh, have been seeing a rise in the number of cases of COVID over the course of the last um, couple of months uh, after a very fast decline in the Omicron surge that occurred uh, in the early part of this year. This new rise is due to new variants of Omicron that are much more transmissible than Omicron itself. And this has led to um, a uh, fairly large number of reinfections of people who've been previously infected and infections of people who've been really careful up to now and have remained careful and are becoming infected, such as you saw on the news last night, our uh, COVID leader, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, himself became infected. Uh, again, reflecting the uh, extremely high transmissibility of the new variants. Next slide. Uh, just like in the uh, US, um, you can see that when you begin to look at things regionally, uh, things have um, started in the Northeast uh, with this new wave of COVID as they often do. Red is the uh, uh, case rate in the Northeast. But what you can see is that the Northeast has gradually begun to improve and things in the West have picked up. So the West is now the, has the highest case rate uh, per capita in the country in this new COVID wave. Next slide. And California uh, is part of the West, obviously. And you can see that uh, we, are had, we had a fairly brisk uptick that uh, began uh, the first part of May and has continued. Uh, we may be beginning to see a little bit of a, of a tailing off as happened to the Northeast, but we still have uh, hi a higher number of cases than we did uh, back during the Delta wave. Next slide. And these are the new CDC um, county risk uh, assessments that show you if you look at the end of last month, the end of, uh, of, of uh, May, uh, most of the country was green. There was a fair amount of activity up in the Northeast, the yellow and the orange areas. Uh, things in the West were, had been green until just a couple of weeks before that. But we began to see uh, areas of middle levels of risk in yellow creeping up along the Colorado, California coast. And that's only continued since that time. You can see now the Bay Area actually has quite a few areas of high transmission and places uh, where uh, people have been vacationing like Florida have begun to heat up quite a bit as you think about your travels uh, in the coming months. Next slide. Now, one thing that uh, we noticed during the Omicron uh, 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 surge uh, was that um, the uh, death rate for people over 65 uh, was uh, higher than we anticipated uh, compared to people under the age of 65. And what you can see here, 
you look at people ages 12 to 64, the death rate during the uh, Delta uh, surge was uh, in the lower part of the curve for people under 65. Those over 65 had a substantially higher uh, uh, death rate. But when you get up to the um, when you get up to the uh, Omicron uh, death rate, you can see that the death rate for those over 65 was uh, one and a half times that Delta peak uh, when you look at the deaths per 100,000. And this reflects uh, a combination of things, but one of which is that we have a fairly large number of seniors who were vaccinated early on uh, in the um, vaccine uh, rollout, uh, whose vaccines are timing out and who haven't been haven't been boosted, and are beginning to get into trouble uh, with waning immunity. Next slide. This is a continuation of the same study, uh, which looks at the deaths uh, per hundred thousand in the Omicron surge, and you can see that. Unvaccinated people uh, had about, uh, in those, those over 65, had a death rate of about 156 per 100,000. If you've been vaccinated, your death rate was six times lower. And if you've been boosted, your death rate was over 20 times lower than the unvaccinated re uh, a group of people. So what this is really saying is that vaccination is important and boosting uh, adds even more protection um, in those who are vulnerable. Uh, with these uh, new variants that are circulating. Next. Now, one of the things that we've <clears throat> been using, and you'll hear more about this metric from Dr. Uh, Martin, who will follow me, uh, to both anticipate surges in COVID uh, and to also understand trends uh, as COVID waves pick up is the level of viral RNA in the wastewater in Point Loma. Uh, this is work that's been done by Rob Knight's group and, and his colleagues, uh, and it's been very helpful throughout the pandemic. You can see in the blue line uh, that we bottomed out uh, in uh, uh, early March, um, got about 900,000 copies of virus uh, per liter. And what you can see is we've had a steady rise since that time, and we now have more virus in the wastewater than we did during the Delta surge. Uh, and uh, you can also see, though, that things may be beginning to level off, although they haven't really been yet declining. This is something that, uh, as Dr. Martin will talk to you in a few minutes, will be a very helpful tool for you to look at when you're trying to assess risk uh, in thinking about going out uh, and engaging in things in the community. Next. And one of the reasons that things are increasing <clears throat> are these shifts in lineage. Uh, lineages are... Um, essentially families of, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, viruses that uh, have been evolving uh, over the course of the last two and a half years. Uh, the new variants uh, are still called Omicron, but they are uh, moving from uh, what started as a BA.1 lineage to BA.4 and BA.5. Each one of these is more transmissible than the one before. And because of this, they're able to push the other ones out of the way. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, B4 and B5, uh, which are dominating the epidemic uh, in, uh, in Europe and other parts of the world, are just beginning to show up in San Diego wastewater and are certainly one of the major contributors uh, to ongoing uh, infection here in uh, San Diego County. Next. So where are we headed? Uh, what we're seeing now is a, we've seen an increase in cases over the course of the last couple of months, uh, and we've seen it not really substantially decline yet. And the three things that we think are contributing to this are declining immunity in the population, people who vaccinated a long time ago and have not been yet boosted, evolution of the variants that are less sensitive to vaccine and prior infection-induced immunity, allowing people to become infected with these new variants more easily uh, that are more transmissible, and fewer people are masking. These three things together, they've contributed to the ongoing cases in San Diego County. And one of the reasons, at least over the next month or two, we don't expect to see substantial declines in activity uh, as you think about uh, your own activity. Let me turn this now over to uh, Dr. Natasha Martin, who will pick up from here and talk more about the new dashboard and, and how to use this to think about what's going on around you. Thanks, Dr. Schooley. 
So while I, um, next slide please. And while I take you through the campus situation, I wanted to show you the updated dashboard that we're continually building out to improve and, and provide more information so that you can better assess the situation both on campus as well in the community and really monitor the metrics that, that we've been monitoring as well. So um, uh, I encourage you to go to this um, website, which is our daily dashboard. It's updated every day. I, you will probably have been familiar with the top part of it, which shows our student daily tests, as well as our cases, our campus employee tests and cases. You can see that at the end of the term, we were averaging about 60 cases a day among the students and about 25 cases a day among employees. That um, has lowered a bit since this last week during at the end of term and with the residential move out. So we're seeing about 25 to 30 cases a day among the students and you know, between 10 and 20 cases a day among the employees. Next slide, please. The dashboard also shows, as you can see on the top left, the percent positivity of the, the percentage of tests that come back positive. That gray line is the uh, county rates, which have been increasing steadily. The blue line is our student rate, which has kind of stabilized over the last couple of weeks, and the campus employees line in golden, which has stabilized as well. Um, information on the right-hand side tells you some averages um, in terms of the last seven days totals. The average test turnaround time averaging in about one day. Um, and there are breakdowns at the bottom you can see in terms of testing and cases among the students by their, those which, who are resident on campus and off campus. Next slide, please. We also have a section where we show county epidemiology. And as Dr. Schooley was mentioning, um, we, we do track the daily cases. That's at the top left. Um, the cases are only reported to the state twice a week. So you see those bars are kind of irregular. The golden lines what give you the rolling seven day averages. So we have seen on average that um, reported cases increasing. On the right hand side, you can see the hospitalizations due to COVID also increasing at the county level. But because we know that there are so many cases that are not reported to the county, home antigen tests, et cetera, um, we really feel that monitoring the wastewater is the most unbiased way for us to understand um, what the true viral activity is at the county. And so um, Dr. Schooley showed you a, a picture of this. This is now on our public dashboard where the um, Point Loma wastewater that's measuring the, the viral load um, measurements is there also showing that same trajectory of kind of a slow increase and then um, slight stabilization in the last week, but, but still very high levels of, of wastewater positivity um, at the county level. Next slide. So we also show information on individuals who, uh, locations where individuals tested positive that had been um, living or working. And so this potential exposure location, again, um, there are sometimes some questions about these parts of the dashboard. So just to clarify this, table shows us where individuals who are diagnosed positive were present. Um, and then next slide, please. The last section of the dashboard below that is our wastewater monitoring dashboard. So this dashboard is really focused on showing where uh, our wastewater monitoring program is collecting wastewater on the UC San Diego campus and where we see positive signals from buildings. So just a reminder, we have over 130 samplers that collect from over 350 buildings on campus every day. Um, we test the wastewater and where we uh, see positive signals that are shown on this dashboard. So the buildings are colored blue if the, the wastewater from those buildings did, uh, did not show evidence of COVID was negative, red if COVID was detected in wastewater from those buildings, um, and gray if either we couldn't collect that day, sometimes the samplers are clogged, or if um, uh, those buildings are not monitored. We now have an option to overlay those red dots are all our locations where individuals who are diagnosed positive are present. So that's overlaying the table information that I just showed you and you can toggle that off on the bottom left if, if you don't want to see that. Um, and just to emphasize, when you're looking at this wastewater information, we have seen quite a lot of red on this, especially in the residential settings for the last couple of weeks. And that's because we now provide the option for students, um, if they can, to isolate in place in their own residences. And so we know that we have many students who are isolating in place that are contributing to positive wastewater signals in residential buildings. Um, and you will um, potentially see that uh, on the dashboard. This map is searchable. You can move it around, you can scroll, you can click on buildings to find the building um, that, you, uh, that you've been working or living in um, in order to search for results. Next slide, please. 
You can also type in your building if you're not sure where it's located or if it's easier for you, there's a little bar there where you can type the building in, um, for example, Nori, which is in the scripts area. And as you can see on the, both in the map, as well as on the bottom, we now show the historical wastewater information. So on the left-hand side, the most recent um, day, you can see here for Nori is blue. That means it was negative. And there were a couple days where it wasn't collected over the weekend, not enough flow, and then negative last week. So you can get this historical information as well. Next slide, please. And finally, this is also a great resource to be able to find where the vending machines are on campus. So there's a little toggle um, that you can turn on and it will show you the nearest building um, that you, oh, sorry, the nearest vending machine where you can get a COVID test kit and um, get tested. So please use this dashboard as a resource. And if there's anything that you wanna see that's not on it, please send us an email and we're happy to build it out. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Angela Sosha who will tell you about the campus policies. Hi. So um, I've, you'll see that a lot of the policies are carrying over from what we had in the spring. And I think this reflects that we're seeing kind of a steady state. And so we're not in a position where we can liberalize policies or where we, can, we need to be more strict. And I think the other part of this is an awareness that we're now each individually managing our own personal health, as well as thinking about those we come in contact with. And so this is why we're trying to give you more tools so that you can keep an eye on what's going on as well, because self decision making is going to be the guidance as we move through this uh, phase of the pandemic. So basically, uh, let's do some updates. Vaccination and booster, we still have the UCOP mandate. The mandate reflects full vaccination, which right now is defined as primary vaccination. And if you are eligible, receiving a single booster. Now, there are second boosters for those that are over 50 or immunocompromised. That yet is not a requirement under the mandate. So fully vaccinated means you've had your primary series. And if you are eligible, you've received your first booster. If you've not, then you're not fully vaccinated and you need to follow the testing guidance on campus, which is twice a week testing. Next slide. So. Uh, for the other thing I want to remind folks is when you become eligible, if you have your primary vaccination, healthcare workers have 15 days to get a booster, campus employees have 30 days. If you develop a COVID infection between primary vaccination and a booster, we extend that by 90 days. If you have an exemption for not being vaccinated, it will cover you for a booster as well. Boosters continue to be available at the Price Center as long as well as primary vaccination. If for some reason you have not had primary vaccination, you can be vaccinated or boosted at the Price Center during the summer. This will be available on Tuesdays and Fridays, and it will be Moderna or Pfizer. So please take advantage of that. Easy access to um, getting vaccination and boosting. Next slide. Um, masking requirements. Masking is extremely effective, and we really encourage you to be relying on KN95s or N95s. Your departments can order them and make them available. Um, if you can't have a KN95 or N95 at your disposal, please double mask with a surgical mask and a cloth covering. Don't rely on either one of those um, as a single cover. You really need both if you don't have a KN95 or an N95 with the close fit. Where is masking required? It's required in the classrooms. That continues to be a requirement in the clinical areas. So at Student Health, our CAP Center, as well as the Price Center, and on campus transportation. There is no change here. We are encouraging masking, though, when you're indoors, particularly if you're around a large number of individuals. Keep your mask on, maybe drop it quickly to have a sip or a quick bite. But masking is going to help you indoors, preventing this really very easily transmissible virus from acquiring infection. Outdoors, if you're in crowded settings and particularly in prolonged contact um, with others, you may want to consider having a mask. Uh, next slide. Isolation requirements. So it still continues to be a 10 day period of isolation from the development of symptoms or from the first moment when you have a positive test if you happen to be someone with minimal symptoms. But there is a change that's been in place for a while that if you don't have any fever, you're not taking Tylenol or anything to suppress a fever, so no fever, and your symptoms are basically resolving or gone and you have a negative rapid antigen test after day five, 
So no sooner, you can do it on day six or later, then you can be released from isolation, but you should mask for the complete 10 day period when you're around others. You should also eat alone. So some other layers of safety so that you don't risk passing the virus on. But the chance is so low with the negative rapid antigen test, we do allow people to move about freely. For employment though, it must be an observed rapid antigen test and COAM will set up those appointments for you. Health system has sites where you can have an observed rapid antigen test. So a self-administered test will not work for returning back to work. Next slide. The other thing I wanna mention about isolation and Nahasha touched on it is we did modify things for our students. For the most of the pandemic until the spring, if you were a student in residential housing, unless you were a graduate student only living with family members, you were moved to hotel isolation space. In the spring, we were able to actually make some changes here and we've had enough experience with it. We feel that this is a good ongoing practice that if you are in a single, you do not need to move to hotel isolation. If you are sharing the bedroom with someone who recently, your roommate is uh, someone who had COVID in the last 60 days, we also, you don't have to move. So we've been able to keep graduates in graduate housing because they have single bedrooms, as well as undergraduates with single bedrooms in place for the last part of the spring break or spring quarter. And this has been very effective. The students uh, do leave to pick up meals, which they order online. Other than that, they're basically in their rooms, uh, except for bathroom moments. Uh, and this has worked very well and reduced the demand of hotel isolation, which became very challenging for us to acquire in the area as people returned to San Diego. We'll continue with this policy. The other change for summer, just so folks are aware of it, we move from hotel isolation to actually on-campus isolation. So one of the seventh buildings will be in isolation place for our students. Um, our degree enrolled students and our REU students will continue to do testing with student health support, and they will move to isolation in the seventh building. So you'll frequently see the seventh building area have a, an exposure positive if you look at the wastewater notifications. And you'll see that we'll continue to have graduates who are isolating in place. There'll be some viral shedding in those areas. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, if you happen to be someone who lives in those buildings, you should still periodically test because there's a chance that not only uh, those individuals we know have an infection, but that maybe you've developed an infection, you're not aware of it. So please don't overly rely on the assumption that a wastewater signal in a building you reside in belongs to someone else. Take advantage of the testing whenever you can. For an exposure, if you've been fully vaccinated, uh, you don't have to isolate or stay at home. Uh, you can move about, but we recommend that you test uh, on notification in day five and that you wear a mask when you're around others on the possibility that you actually will convert. For individuals who aren't vaccinated, then we do want you to stay out of the workforce at least for the first five days and then to have a test. And if it's negative, then you can come back um, and uh, if you're not having any symptoms. So some minor modifications there. Next slide. Okay, I do want to remind everybody to take advantage of campus vending machines. They are fully available to us. Um, we do turn down and turn off the machines in the residential undergraduate areas where we don't have students anymore. Uh, obviously near the seventh area, we do have students living as well as isolating. There's plenty of testing available as well as all the other vending machines. And the RTL site is updated with those uh, sites that have active vending machines. Remember you swap with your uh, campus ID, make sure you capture the barcode. That's how the vial is identified to be your sample with a pickups end by 2 p.m. And then you we should have your results back that night. Most often, occasionally it's the next day. Please don't give your identity to somebody else that creates an awful lot of confusion uh, for us. Uh, so vending machines will be open throughout. We will not have pickups on July 3rd and 4th. So if you've got some plans for the holiday, you wanna test before that. And then if you've been traveling about, you may wanna test when you come back. So those are the updates for campus at this time, and we'll continue to monitor the chat. Thank you. Oh, and the uh, thumbs are working perfectly. So they're still in place. So take advantage of the daily screener. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schooley, Martin, and Sosha. Hopefully the technical difficulties with my mic level are better now.
But uh, in any case, next, we will hear from Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Allison Satterland, about student compliance. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to, to be with you. And I, I, I want to thank so much um, ABC Continetti for uh, providing this venue for us. So I wanted to share some data points with all of you as we reflect on this last academic year. Of course, um, all kudos go to our incredible students who have worked very, very diligently to modify their behavior in such a manner as to encourage the safety of our campus community. Uh, so with this in mind, in our, our last academic year, uh, fall 2021 through spring 2022, uh, we supported and sent 306 residential wastewater alerts, again, uh, reflecting the daily monitoring of wastewater signals across our residential and non-residential environment, uh, results in the sending of uh, direct messages in our uh, workplaces, as well as our residential environments after we see two to three days of consistent positivity. So um, our students then are expected to respond to uh, testing in their um, communities so we can further monitor the spread uh, of the uh, virus. Our team also hosted a COVID-19 Canvas compliance course in fall 2021. Um, in early November, we had 793 students who were not compliant. Uh, after the launch of the COVID-19 Canvas compliance course, uh, as of December 2nd, we had 52 students who were non-compliant and then formally referred to the Office of Student Conduct. Um, our team hosted three calling campaigns uh, with um, more than 1,233 actual phone calls um, made to students, uh, which we uh, take to be um, a great success, noting that students prefer uh, to text than actually speak with folks on the phone. So um, that was a, a positive experience for all of us and resulted in quite a bit of uh, communication and student um, voluntary compliance. Our team sent out uh, 5,382 rapid antigen tests in support of testing compliance, uh, both to um, on-campus students and, and off-campus students who would be coming to campus during the course of the academic year. Our, our student conduct team navigated more than 5,071 um, uh, referrals for COVID-19 non-compliance. This was related primarily to testing expectations, guest policy violations, and gatherings, um, which resulted in by far the majority of our referrals to student conduct. 3% um, of our cases were at the result of students not being compliant with face coverings, but otherwise uh, the, the team worked very closely with partners across campus to resolve uh, those 5,000 plus cases. Uh, we also had um, a number of email communication engaging in education expectation setting with our students. More than 8,000 emails were sent um, and exchanged during this last year in support of COVID-19 um, compliance. And we did also approve through a very rigorous process um, more than 650 faith-based vaccine mandate exemptions, which resulted in students needing to, um, of course, wear face coverings and then also test uh, twice weekly. As we plan for the new um, academic year of fall 2022 uh, through spring 2023, as Dr. Sosha mentioned, we do expect our compliance expectations to remain um, steady. Certainly, we'll be preparing for a similar vaccine mandate uh, to stay with us in the coming um, academic year. Um, we anticipate that as we transition between um, significant periods of change on the campus, for example, when thousands of new students move in to on-campus housing in the fall um, or return after spring break, that we will see phase one uh, expectations in terms of congregate living. And certainly with expectations around testing when a wastewater signal is uh, noticed in a residential environment in support, again, of, of monitoring and, and um, containing the spread of our um, COVID-19 virus. I also wanted to share with all of you that we will keep our students um, updated and engaged by way of 
the studentcovidcompliance.ucsd.edu website, um, as well as have been working with our partners in the registrar's office, uh, the undergraduate colleges and the graduate division to ensure that incoming students by way of a checklist know what the expectations are as it relates to being um, vaccinated and plus boosted and anticipating public health behaviors that will keep um, UC San Diego safer for all of us in the coming academic year. And we have a soft mandate of July 11th for incoming students uh, across um, the university to be in compliance with our vaccine mandate. So I wanted to uh, thank uh, our students in particular for the incredible work this year, provide you all with a brief summary of our students' compliance behaviors and preview some of what we're expecting um, in the coming um, academic year. Thank you so very much. And now I will transition this to um, Back to Bob for our next colleague's um, update and presentation. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you, Vice Chancellor Satterland. Now we will have some updates on instruction from Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation, Carlos Jensen. Carlos? Thank you, Dr. Condonetti. Uh, it's my pleasure to again share with you some exciting highlights of where we are and, and what's coming up next. So summer term is just around the corner. We already have students moving in for our various bridge programs or student success programs, et cetera. Um, and uh, so far the demand is, has been incredible. We have a lot of programs uh, coming back to campus. So uh, three over 370 or 369 um, uh, REUs coming to campus, 1200 students in various bridge programs, 22 global seminars, uh, youth camps are sold out, et cetera. Um, and this wouldn't have been possible without our, our partners in Student Health, Office of Campus Council, ITS, ID Card Center, HDH, everybody working together to make sure that we can do this and we can do this safely. Demand for uh, summer session and summer classes remains strong. We saw a 50% increase um, in demand as the pandemic kicked in we're still operating at that same high level. Um, and about this summer, about half of the classes will be in-person and half will remain remote. Um, so the, the, the final reminder about summer is that the outdoor classrooms are coming down. They are scheduled to come down in the next uh, couple of weeks. This is for uh, cleaning, for refurbishment. We will retain them and we will be able to redeploy them if the situation requires us to do so. But it's time for them to, to get a rest and to, uh, to be cleaned. Next. So as we look towards fall, um, you know, uh, Chip Schooley has given you an update on uh, what the uh, evolution of the pandemic has been, and we will continue to monitor and we will continue to adapt depending on what happens. But for now, uh, fall classes look to be um, a strong return to in-person. Uh, we have about 3% of undergraduate enrollments uh, being online and 97% uh, being in-person. Um, we have a lot more courses being in hybrid mode. So where some of the instruction is happening remotely, but the majority is happening in person. And remember, that's the flexibility that you always have at your disposal. Up to 50% of the instruction can be remote without the course needing to get an R course designator. Um, as we're coming back uh, to, to basically full in person uh, instruction, understand that we're trying to make every effort that we can to accommodate uh, space and time preferences for scheduling courses. But as it was before the pandemic, so it remains today that we are very tight on time and uh, space is at a premium. Um, and before I, I turn things back over to Dr. Cantonetti, just remind you all that fall will introduce two new uh, requirements for all faculty. One is a syllabus requirement uh, that Senate passed, and the other is a reporting of commencement of academic activity. And um, Jim Rollins will uh, share with us a little bit more about that. And finally, remember that teaching and learning commons are always here to help um, with any of these requirements. Well, thank you, ABC Jensen. Uh, that was a good segue because now we are going to hear about the new commencement of act academic activity requirement and some enrollment updates from 
Associate Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management, Jim Rawlins. Jim. Thank you, Dr. Continetti, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the commencement of academic activity is a key thing that I know several of you have already shown up to other conversations about. Uh, it represents a lot of important work for us to do uh, based on federal requirements. And what we've put in place for the campus really emerges from great work by staff and my registrars and financial aid colleagues areas. Uh, one of whom, Dave Garrison, is on our chat today and might be able to answer some detailed questions if you all have them in the Q&A. But some basic things to let you know, for one thing, this is not a new requirement, but one that is new uh, in regards to our involvement in it. Higher education institutions, any of us that receive federal aid must report basically the start of teaching students every term. That commencement of academic activity uh, relates to the fact that our financial aid and scholarships office is giving over $500 million a year in aid to our students. It means we really need to track this and it's a very key part of what these students experience. While our policies at UC San Diego don't necessarily dictate that we do this or the UC system, again, it is a federal requirement that we do something related to taking attendance and those federal regulations require that we be able to document that each student aid recipient has gotten some kind of academic activity in each course by a certain point. And go ahead and advance the slide, please. So some of this has to do with things that will begin summer term right now. And those of you involved with summer instruction or students who are taking those courses, you'll see right away us being in compliance with this by having some basic ways right up front at the start of the term for it to be indicated whether or not that student has indeed begun engagement with the course. Any of you that are instructors or students that are seeing this, you're gonna have two basic ways this can be done. One that can be certified is through an academic activity tracking system, and you can find information on that at aats.ucsd.edu, or there could be a FinAid assignment in Canvas. Either of those two approaches will work. Anybody who has additional questions about that, I strongly encourage you to reach out to our registrar's office who is handling a lot of the implementation of this. Dave, our, associate, our senior associate director in the registrar's office and his colleagues are able to help you with your questions you can reach them at registrar.ucsd.edu. One last slide with some more general information is that I'm certain uh, with the information that ABC Jensen's just shared and some of the things that I'm talking about, this is a time of year where it's on many people's minds to wonder how things are coming together for our new student enrollments for the fall. There's a lot that we still can't finish taking out of the oven and sharing with you as a final result yet, but we can let you know in general, there's some really exciting things come together. Much on people's mind is the sheer size of our incoming class of new first year and transfer students. And I want to give you a sense that because of some things we've done very carefully, especially in the admissions office, to very carefully look at how students respond to our offer of admission. We aim to hit targets we set for this fall that will give us a new incoming cohort for fall 22 that's roughly 1,100 students smaller than fall of 2021. This is in accordance with some plans we've made. It involves many things we try to balance about our mix of in-state, out-of-state, and international students, recognizing that some of the majors are capped and other things are there for our goals and kind of our limitations as a campus. We're very excited with some things we can tell you in a preliminary way that due to a lot of things that are going together, we have an incoming class that's going to represent some wonderful things about the diversity of the state of California and beyond. One thing in particular I'm excited about related to the next bullet on this screen is that the Regents and UCOP leadership has given us the ability to do much, much more towards what we call a debt-free UC education. Through those kinds of measures, we have a higher percentage than ever of our lower income students being likely to feel they can accept our offer of admission. That's gonna be borne out in some of the things we're able to see in the access that's represented across our incoming class. And meanwhile, even though our class is smaller than last year, Relevant to the many things that the ABC Jensen mentioned about space limitations, we're thinking very much about how this is going to play into things. Again, we are gonna have a smaller class that's more in line with what we anticipated this year uh, compared to last year, but we're gonna still need to think very much about how space fits into the scheduling of classes, the times at which we offer them and the things we're gonna need your support and help to get through. So we're looking forward to it. Thanks, that's it from us. All right, thank you, ABC Rollins. Now we will hear from our final group of presenters today about the Office of Contracts and Grants Administration and Research Updates, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Contracts and Grants, Ross Damon, and Vice Chancellor for Research, Corinne Peek Asa. Ross. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you, Senior ABC Continetti. 
again, appreciate the opportunity to share with everyone some new changes that we believe will better support researchers and research administrators um, experience with the Office of Contract and Grant Administration, particularly around improving the response time and the customer inquiries, as well as reducing award delays. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the, uh, the Office of Contract and Grant Administration has the vested authority to submit sponsored research proposals and accept awards on behalf of the university. There are three other sponsored project offices across campus to support your proposal review and submission. That's the Office of Clinical Trials Administration, Health Sciences Sponsored Project Office, and Scripps Institution of Oceanography, OCGA. Uh, today's changes uh, that I'm gonna briefly talk about today only affect your engagement with the Office of Contract and Grant Administration, not the other three offices. Um, as you can see, our mission statement really expresses that our overarching goal is to continue to provide outstanding service to the research community with high quality expertise and knowledge in sponsor and institutional policies to ensure you get your proposal submitted on time and the awards set up within a reasonable time while mitigating institutional risk. Our office reviews and submits over 2,700 proposals annually and negotiates and accepts over 1,600 uh, new awards annually. And over the last few years, we've heard from you through customer satisfaction survey that our services were subpar, not meeting expectations. And in addition to the proposal and award growth, we decided that something had to change. Um, next slide, please. One of the challenges we heard from you was the lack of transparency into what the status of your agreement is. Are we waiting? What are we waiting on within the Office of Contract and Grants, the sponsor or compliances? The inability to proactively work with departments to help improve their compliance with the 14, five and two proposal timelines. Um, inconsistent experience, research and administrators would occasionally receive conflicting or incomplete information, causing confusion and responses were sometimes delayed. So the benefit of this new model that I'll share with you in a second is the subject matters experts who are part of specialized team that can support the most challenging and complex contract and grant issues. A, dedicated, a new dedicated client experience team to support the majority of your questions and have those questions answered to, for you in a reasonable time. And finally, adding graduate division fellowships to our scope of responsibilities to help minimize the number of offices you need to go to for support. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a visual to help articulate our new model, really focusing on three functional areas a dedicated proposal team to committed to ensuring your proposal is carefully reviewed and submitted on time. A the team is highly focused on helping you get all of the necessary information into the quality research system. The second functional area are those highly specialized teams focused on a discrete set of responsibilities. And you can see the six teams listed there. Each of those teams are focused exclusively on award negotiation and processing the award in a timely manner. And then finally, the biggest change to our organization is the development of the client experience team that is committed to answering your questions in a timely manner. Previously, questions may have gone to the contract and grant officer, some of who may have moved on from our department and therefore questions may not have been answered. Now going forward, we're asking that all questions be directed to research admin at ucsd.edu. And there's a client experience agent waiting for your question. Current resolution time is less than one day and satisfaction is very high. We hope that these changes will result in a positive experience and encouraging results. And we'd be happy to come back in six months to share those results and the progress that we've made. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. And I'll hand it back over to, or I'll hand it to Vice Chancellor for Research, Corey Piquesa. Great, thank you. I wanna make sure we leave some time for questions. So I'll be quick. Um, I wanna just announce and uh, really celebrate the fact that we have had another, or on track to have another record year in research funding. And behind all that funding, the most important part of it, I don't wanna focus on the numbers, but is the work that we do in discovery and creativity and helping with some of the very thorny issues our world is challenged with. So we have, there, there's not a single relevant issue in the world right now where we are not conducting some kind of research um, in some areas that we don't even know they're relevant yet where we're conducting research. And I. I, want, I have a list of some of the areas where we have a, a really distinctive research uh, portfolio of research discovery, creativity. Um, film history might stand out a little bit there, uh, but the reason I put that in there is because we do amazing work in arts and humanities. And as we are uh, dealing with so many of these thorny issues, 
um, how we integrate and make art accessible to everyone, how we research that is also a very important um, an integral part of what we do, but a piece I want us all to think about engaging with right now. We go to the next slide. I also I want to highlight uh, at this town hall how important we are as a university innovation hub. Uh, we have innovation going on all across campus in every school and every college, um, but also a very strong um, centralized office of innovation and commercialization. We rank again and again in the top 10, top five, um, universities for innovation, and that includes measures and metrics like student startups, uh, licenses, patents, faculty startups, and also partnerships with private industry ranging from the smallest, newest startup companies to the most established global companies. Uh, there are a number of um, opportunities uh, for those of you on the town hall that are students to get involved in those, including um, uh, the first floor of our design and innovation building, which is called the basement, and it is solely designed for student innovation and entrepreneurial activities, uh, including things like the Innovation for National Security Challenge. Um, we have uh, other um, opportunities for students that work with small startups. We have uh, groups like the zoo and the airport local uh, uh, partnerships that bring challenges to students. Um, one group, for example, solved the problem of how to feed a specific breed of monkey who like to eat really high up in the treetops, um, how we can, the workers can safely get that food up to them. So some really fun things going on in innovation. Uh, and, it's, and it's really clear that the nation is starting to notice what an innovation leader we are. Next slide, please. So I wanna say thank you. It is really phenomenal that we have been able to be such an important part of, of research, discovery, creativity, um, while so many challenging things are going on around us. That's due to work of so many people on so many levels. The students who constantly bring new ideas and energy into our, um, into our teams, uh, the work of Ross Damon, uh, who makes sure our contracts and grants, our compliance, our uh, all on board and the research infrastructure is, is working. Many people working in our schools departments um, that are also making sure that things are uh, moving forward. And uh, so with that, I will end with a big thank you. I'll turn it over to Bob and we can answer some of your questions. Well, thank you, ABC Damon, Vice Chancellor Piquesa and all of our presenters today. Now it is time for the question and answer segment of the town hall. At this time, I would like to invite all of our panelists to turn on their videos. We've received a number of questions uh, that we're gonna, in light of the time, move, uh, move, to, uh, move to address uh, now. So let's see, the first question, the first question is uh, what, and this is for uh, Dr. Sosha. What is guiding the decision on when faculty will be allowed to lecture unmasked and when students will be allowed to attend lectures unmasked? Always a great question. Um, we're going to continue to monitor, like we are, the multiple sources of information that suggest what the viral level is in our community, um, as well as our vaccination and boosting rates. Um, it's, we've been very fortunate that classroom transmission has not been a problem for us. With the masking, we have allowed um, the classroom to be a very safe space. Um, it tends to be a close proximity space. We know that indoor spaces are also more vulnerable for transmission. So for now, um, we're going to start summer session with masking in the classrooms. Um, and I think that's the prudent thing to do. But we will continue to monitor every week, every day. We're looking at what's uh, available to us. And if it's appropriate, we'll uh, make a change to liberalize masking uh, later on. But um, I wouldn't guarantee it's going to happen because uh, right now it looks like this viral level may stay with us for at least uh, a few more weeks or maybe a couple months. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. For uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Jensen, will the option to teach remotely be available for parents of children too young to be vaccinated? So, um, first of all, there's there's seems to be good news on the the front of these vaccines now again going up for review, and so hopefully we will have uh, those vaccines approved for younger children before too long. I know that this has been a major concern for many of our colleagues that have young children. Um, 
What we can and can't do with uh, remote teaching is a complicated question because part of that is under the control of uh, academic senate. Academic senate controls the distance education policy. We're in constant dialogue and we're gonna try to find ways of um, accommodating people where we can. Um, understand that um, we, we have processes in place when it's for personal health or personal circumstances. We don't have a lot of infrastructure. We don't even have a lot of information about who has dependents. And so it's, it's difficult, but we are looking at it and we'll, we'll hopefully get some guidance uh, before tomorrow. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, for Dr. Schooley, will UC San Diego offer vaccines for children under five once they're eligible? Do you have any updates regarding timing of FDA and CDC approval of the vaccine for that age group? It, it looks like we're really right, right on the cusp of having uh, uh, all of the regulatory approvals uh, within the next week or 10 days. I uh, think through the FDA move uh, reasonably quickly, the CDC still has to opine, but I think we're nearing the end of that phase of the um, pediatric vaccine evaluation. Now, Dr. Sosha may answer this, but in general, UCSD does not provide care to people um, in the pediatric age group, and this is more of a radius thing, but um, do you know if there are any exceptions being made for uh, children of faculty, staff, and students, Angela? Yeah, no, I think that um, while we cannot do that at the Price Center, we've not been uh, vaccinating uh, the uh, five to 12 year, you know, the young, younger kids. We don't do pediatric care there, but the health system does have pediatric care available. In multiple sites. And so they do offer um, within UC San Diego Health pediatric vaccination. So that will be great for our families. But, but not on campuses, I guess, the, what I was but Not saying. on campus. No, we won't be able to do it at the Price Center. That, that's something we will, won't be able to offer. Um, it's a little more complicated. We're just not set up for that. But our families will be able to get it through the health system. All right. Thank you. Okay, what is probably our last uh, question goes to ABC Rollins and ABC Jensen concerning scheduling of classes. And the question is, why are there so many fall discussion sections scheduled at eight and 9 p.m.? Did enrollment grow that much? I'll take that one on unless ABC Jensen wants to arm wrestle me for it. Um, we have been operating remotely or in hybrid mode for the last two years. So it's, a report, it's important that we remember to get back to the before times, so to speak. We were already teaching a lot in the evenings uh, to go back a little bit with the most used classrooms running nonstop from 8 a.m. to about 8 or 9 p.m. We've built up a lot, but we're growing back as fast as we can. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna grow in the same way our, our buildings are. As our growth slows, which is again, what we're trying to do through some of the numbers like I just shared with you, we do hope to be able to do some de-densifying a bit more this fall, but we also need to think about the diverse needs of the student population we're bringing in. There are students who may need to work during the day, and for them especially, benefiting from the availability of evening offerings is going to be a great thing to try to balance that out. Well, thank you. Thank you, ABC Rollins. So, yeah, I think that is about uh, all the time we have for uh, today. So, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody for their questions, and I want to thank the presenters again. We'll do our best to answer additional questions because we did receive some others by updating the FAQ that is on the Return to Learn website and posting a recording of this town hall as well. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the presenters and guests for sharing their time and very useful information with us today. And I thank you, the faculty and researchers of UC San Diego for attending and working together as a community to help bring us through these unprecedented times. We had more than 235 attendees today. And as I mentioned earlier, these town halls have been an important part of how we've stayed united as a community. To help improve them, we encourage you to complete the post-event survey that will be sent shortly to help us continue to refine our communications to our, the broader campus community. The next town hall for staff will be Thursday, July 14th. And you can visit the uh, Human Resources Staff Town Hall page to register as shown in the chat on the, on the screen. This concludes uh, the Return to Learn Faculty and Research Town Hall for the end of the academic year 2021-2022. So I thank you again. Take care, stay safe, and I hope to see all of you here on campus again soon.